Hi, welcome to Trading with TK, teaching you to turn ideas into money. And this is our weekend wrap-up where we're going to turn this into a question and answer period today. I'm going to try and answer some questions that were sent in to me. And a common theme of most of the, a lot of the questions was, uh, what's my process? What do I use? How do I come up with my ideas? So I'm going to address that right now. Uh, you see this uh, stock table behind me? Well, I have a dart and I... Nah, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Here's the process. I uh, scan, I have a scan in my computer, and uh, this is the criteria. Volume is first, 30-day moving average, minimum of 400,000 shares a day or more. Volume is key. You need to be able to get in and get out. I, I don't like trading in liquid stocks. So uh, 400,000 shares or, or more, and even on a slow day, the stocks that have 400,000 shares of 30-day moving average, some days only trade 300. So you have to take that into consideration also. But most of the stocks I bring trade, um, you, some of them can trade a million a day. So they're somewhat liquid, so um, I, I want you to know that. Next is price. Um, price is uh, it's relative because my, my point is that I, I, I'm looking for a return on my capital. And I also believe that it's easier for a $2 stock to go to 4 than a $20 stock to go to 40 And it's the same return on capital. Uh, you're at, you're tying up more capital than a $20 stock, and they don't move as fast as a lower price stock. Um, I'm not against high price stocks. I mean, we recommended Apple two weeks ago. Uh, we recommended it at 125 and then we sold it at 144 we, we left a little on the table, but it, you know, it was a good trade. The pattern is what's important to me, as, as, uh, not, not so much the price. Uh, but I do know lower price stocks are easier to move on the upside than, than higher price stocks. So that's my reasoning there. The next is, how do I find the formations? Do I have a, um, a scan for that? Unfortunately, I wish I did, but you know, this being a, uh, an art, not a science, it's very difficult to tell a computer to look for something that you, only you can see in your own eyes. So I have to manually go through hundreds of stocks every night, but I do it every day, and these stocks are, I know what these charts look like in my head without even looking, looking them up. And I, I usually don't bring them to you until I'm pretty sure that I've been watching them for a while, that they're, that they're building something that, that looks like could respond in the direction that I think they're going to go in. Unfortunately, not every single one of these works out, but the majority of them do. So I want you, I want you to know that. Okay, next question was about moving averages. They never see moving averages on my charts. Well, moving averages can be helpful, but they, uh, they're a two-edged two sword. And uh, if you look at a chart and you say, oh, yeah, I like that chart, or somebody gave you a tip, or um, you look at it and say, oh, yeah, um, and then you go searching for a moving average to support your belief. And you, know, you start with the 100, no, that doesn't work. Uh, it's a 50, the 30, the 10, the 5, the 1. You, you'll find something. To, to, so you can you're fitting the moving average into something that you already believe already, and and the moving average becomes useless at that point. You're kidding yourself with it. So and also an, an, another uh, problem that I found with moving averages after a stock has moved up 20 or 30 percent, and the moving average is coming up underneath it, and most people look at that moving average and they think it's a support area, and and it's not. It, I mean it could be, but m most of the time it's not. So you need to be careful of moving averages because moving averages are a lagging indicator. The only thing that makes them go up is the stocks up ahead of them. So uh, keep that in mind. That's, that's why I'm, uh, and plus they clog up my chart. I, sometimes I can't see the pattern with them when there's too many of them around. So I, I like to keep it clean and I, I'm a pattern guy. So I hope that uh, answers those questions. And the next thing was that the people wanted me to, to talk a little bit about the role of the specialist on the New York Stock Exchange which I love talking about because I was there for so many years and I've, I've spoken to uh, training classes and institutional uh, uh, fund managers all across the country while I was active on the floor and uh, I represented the New York Stock Exchange Educational Committee and, um, and so they would send me around to um, you know, uh, help people understand the system and I'm going to try and do that to you right, for you right now. Uh, it all. I'm going to take it down to its simplest form where it first started. It started back in the colonial days down in the corner of Broad and Wall under the Buttonwood tree and people who wanted to buy or sell their shares would meet down there. And the problem was that it could take days or weeks before you'd find the other side of your trade. And then a couple of smart guys, one of them being Michael J. Meehan, who was the founder of the firm that I was originally with and um, uh, stayed with for a long, long time on the floor. 
um, got this idea. He said, gee, you know, maybe if I were to uh, add a little liquidity to this market, make this guy a bid, uh, and he'd sell them to me, maybe tomorrow or the day after that, the next guy down the street would be a buyer. I'd be able to mark it up and sell it out to him, and I could make this spread. And uh, so that's what he started doing, and hence the specialist business was born. Uh, the concept, anyway. And what he basically was doing was adding liquidity to the marketplace. And that's exactly what the specialist does today. Then, as things uh, got a little more active, a seller would show up, and he didn't maybe like the price that uh, Mike was willing to buy the uh, stock at. And the guy says, well, no, I have a limit at 21. You're willing to pay me 20, so now I'll wait. And Mike says, well, you don't have to wait. Give me the order, and I'll represent you. So hence now he's a, an agent. So And today, it's the only class of broker on the floor that can act as agent and principal at the same time. All other brokers are either principal traders or agent traders. None of them can wear both hats. Only the specialist has that uh, responsibility. And his responsibility is uh, to add liquidity to the marketplace. That's, that's his whole function down here as the, new, as the exchange sees it. So then the country grows and they move inside and they leave the other, the latecomers outside trading smaller, thinner stocks. And those guys were referred to as the guys out on the curb. When that, that name stuck, that's actually the American Stock Exchange guys because eventually they found their own building. But today it's still called the curb. You know, it's funny how these names stick. And uh, so then as this more and more stocks would come into the exchange, uh, the exchange came up with an allocation uh, system to allocate these stocks to different specialists. Uh, they graded them and they, they had their own system to do it. It's lengthy to go into, but there, there, there was a system that the exchange used. And also they have uh, guidelines of the specialist. You know, the specialist can't do whatever he wants. He has to uh, add liquidity. And they have guidelines of how many shares must trade in a certain range before the specialist uh, can let the stock down. So the specialist has to be a buyer when there's no other buyers, but he doesn't have to stick his finger in the dike either. He has to let the stock down in some orderly fashion to a level again where the public can start doing business with themselves. As a matter of fact, when, it, when I finally left the floor of the exchange, the specialist was only res uh, actually responsible for 10% of the transactions that went on. So his job was to get the stock from where it was to where it wants to go in an orderly fashion so the public can, you know, uh, trade with themselves. That's, that's basically what the specialist does. Uh, <coughs> He's uh, entrusted with a lot of orders. He has a book full of orders, and um, some of them are stop orders. And uh, you have to remember, he didn't tell you to put that stop order in there. That was your decision. But it's his, it's his uh, obligation that if there's no other buyers and you have a sell stop order in there and it gets elected and it becomes a market order, he's got to buy it. If there's no other buyers, he's the one who's buying it. And he's going to try and buy it at the lowest price he can within the guidelines. And usually when your stop goes off, there's a bunch of other stops there, and they're always going to go off at a discount. And he'll buy them down at a discount, and then maybe hopefully two hours later the stock rises and he, and he gets out and makes a quarter. And that's what he does. He's in, he's out, back and forth all day long, just making spreads, uh, um, weighing risk, and um, trying, to make, trying to make a buck for himself also within the guidelines. Now, if he fails to add liquidity to the market, uh, the way the stock exchange wants them to, then uh, the exchange will take uh, take the stock away from them. And also, the exchange is self-governed. They have a they have their own little police department. It's called market surveillance, and they're always watching. Um, and they want to keep the business nice and clean because credibility is credibility is big with the exchange. They 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 want to make the public know that they're safe and things are on the up and up. And uh, and I'll tell you, I was there 25 years, and they absolutely are on the up and up. Uh, they, the specialist adds liquidity, and I mean the day of the '87 crash, the, the Nasdaq market basically cut sh shut down. The, the 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 dealers wouldn't answer their phone. So if you wanted to be a seller, you you couldn't sell. There was no there was no market. And the New York Stock Exchange, there was a market. You may not have liked the price that we were bidding you, but if you wanted to sell, you could sell. And at the end of the day, we had we had no buying power left that day. But the system worked, and. Um, and it's just uh, it's a it's a it's a pretty good system. Like I said, we have an obligation to make to make markets, and uh, and 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 we do we do the best best we could. So I, I hope that answers a lot of questions about uh, my uh, my approach to picking stocks. And I hope I've enlightened you a little bit more about how the special system works on the floor of the exchange. And I have another video coming out uh, before Monday. I have a couple more picks. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, segment of question and answer. 
And until uh, I see you again, this is TK signing off.